My name is John Cool with the Congressional Youth Leadership Council. We have 20 of our students here today for a conversation with two former members of Congress about becoming a representative of Congress, public service, and campaigning. This is the first in a series of webcasts that are part of the Civics Connection, a joint project by the Lou Fry Institute of Government at the University of Central Florida and the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress. These webcasts are made possible via a grant from the U.S. Department of Education and are meant to enable high school students to learn more about their government by asking questions of former legislators. We are joined by two former representatives, Bev Byron, who represented Maryland as a Democrat, and by former representative Sherry Bollert, who represented upstate New York as a Republican. Let me give each of them a quick chance to introduce themselves, and then we're going to open up the floor to questions. Ms. Byron, why don't we start with you? Thank you, John. Uh, first of all, I uh, served in Congress for 14 years. Uh, I w represented uh, Western Maryland, uh, but Western Maryland started at the end of the uh, Cavan John Bridge uh, and went, uh, as I say, almost to Pittsburgh. So it was a very large, large district. Uh, a lot of diversity within that district. I served on the Armed Services Committee, uh, the uh, Insular Affairs, and they've changed the name of that committee, uh, but it basically uh, was water and power, and then, uh, which was one of my loves, was the uh, National Park Service. And Congressman Bollard? Hi, I'm Sherry Bollard, and I served in Congress for 24 years, and uh, retired at the end of 06, voluntarily, I might add. While in Congress, I served on the Science Committee, uh, eventually was chairman of that committee, served on the Joint Committee on Intelligence, served on the newly formed at that time Homeland Security Committee and uh, the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. So I was a, a busy, active uh, member of Congress. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you students. We're going to divide our, up our show into three parts, and the first part is going to be um, about how these members of Congress decided to first run in the first place. So we're going to go ahead and up and take the first question. Um, hello, my name is Winnie Chang, and I'm from New Jersey. Um, did the motivation to become a Congress member come from yourself or from others? I can answer that first, and it is, it is an answer that will not be the normal answer. My husband had been a member, uh, was running for re-election uh, for his fourth term uh, when he went out to train for the Marine Corps Marathon and died of a massive coronary uh, the uh, first week in October. So within a 24-hour period of time, I became a widow, widow a single parent of a 13-year-old, a candidate for Congress. Uh, and so that first election cycle, I got 91 percent of the vote. Uh, the uh, powers that be thought, well, she won't be around long. She'll serve one term, and then we can get a real candidate uh, in for the job. And I think one of the things that is, it is so important for young people to realize is circumstances change. They don't know which direction they might be going, but an opportunity comes along, and grab that opportunity. Uh, I was there for 14 years. Opportunity, an old saying that uh, opportunity is uh, when luck uh, meets preparation. But I got involved because when I was a student in high school, my high school government teacher got me all excited about government. I said, gee, that might be something I would like to explore when I uh, get older. And then when I got in college, I, I followed the advice I have later given young people. Get involved. I got involved as a junior in college with a congressman, and I did all the routine work, folding letters and stuffing envelopes, and driving him around, putting up signs. And I watched him every step of the way, and I decided, this looks really interesting. I might want to explore this as a career possibility. And uh, I did. And I was an instant success. I graduated <laughs> from college. It only took me 18 years to get to Congress. Thanks for the question. Take the next one. Hi, I'm David Altier, and I'm from Connecticut. Um, my question is, what made you decide to run for Congress? Uh, were you always interested in politics, and who um, might have influenced you um, in your career choice? Well, as I indicated uh, to the previous question, I got all excited about it from my high school government teacher who made government exciting, and, 
And you all know from your experience, there are some teachers who make their subject really exciting. I don't care what the subject is, and you really look forward to that class. That's what happened with me. And then when I got involved and got exposed uh, close up by being an assistant, if you will, to the congressman, uh, I decided to, this is something that really has unlimited possibilities for any young person to get involved in shaping public policy that's going to affect all of our lives. And I've pursued that. I was chasing a dream. Let me, uh, let me touch that because uh, my office staff would get very upset with me because I would say I needed a job and it was the only thing that was offered. <laughs> um, and yet, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I was very familiar with government. I was much aware of the inner action of, of government. And so it wasn't, it wasn't uh, at all unusual. Had been involved in my husband's career. He was in the uh, state legislature for eight years. He was in Congress for eight years. And therefore, I did have a, a, an understanding of, of what uh, was required in, in the congressional arena. Thank you. My name is Connor Ward. I'm from Florida. And um, I was wondering what issues provoked you to run for Congress? And how did you get started doing that? Sure. Um, as I said, my, my background was, was not uh, I'd love to say I'd always wanted to be in Congress. It wasn't the case. By the same token, there are certain things as you grow up that you're really interested in. Uh, our family has been backpacking and hiking and, and interested in the national park system, so that was a natural fit for me. Uh, my husband had been in the, uh, in the Army. We had lived in Germany for a while. My father had been uh, during World War II in the Navy. So. I had spent a lot of time looking at um, the military and military uh, systems. So that was another one that, uh, that uh, I was, was very interested in. And so consequently, I took a look at that. One of the things that I think is interesting as a freshman member, the first thing you are asked is to pick your committee assignments. Well, I thought, A, you're not going to get on ways and means. You're not going to get on appropriations. So I thought, and I'm not an attorney, and I'm not going to get on judiciary. So I had to give them three choices, and I said, well, I will take ways and means, judiciary, and then armed services. Well, they had to give me one out of the three, so I got armed services. So you learn real quick how to work the system. Mm -hmm. Congressman Bullitt, was there an issue for you that, that wanted, made you want to get involved? Well, you know, I was raised by my grandmother. My parents were divorced when I was four. My grandmother raised me. I lived in a second-floor apartment in the inner city of Utica, New York, a small city. but you know, a modest means, but just a very good life, had a good food on the table every day, and a grandmother who really loved me and paid attention to me. But I looked around the neighborhood, and it was beginning to deteriorate, as a lot of central cities are. And I saw people who had a lot less than I had. And I quickly had a feeling that, you know, there's some people that work so hard, and they never are able to get beyond where they are now. And why is that? Shouldn't government have some programs to help them? And that sparked my interest, but it really wasn't ignited, that spark, until I got into college and studied more and became a student activist and said, this is something that I'd like to pursue, and I did. So I, I was chasing a dream, and I would urge all of you to have dreams and, and go after them, pursue them. Dreams can come true, but it takes hard work. Let's take one more Thank question you. on this part of the discussion. Um, my name is Alex Anker. I'm from New York. And in college, if you want to study, become involved in a career in politics, uh, what courses should you take? Well, I thought you were going to say what you, and I was going to say volunteer, volunteer, mm -hmm. volunteer. Um, you know, government courses, uh, English, uh, and, and I think most colleges in this day and age have, uh, have speech because it is very important for a young person to have the self-confidence to be able to get up and explain their ideas. Yeah, Bev, I, I would echo that and say the most important skill you can acquire while you're in college, I don't care what your chosen career path is, is the ability to communicate, both written and orally. You would be amazed at the number of people 
who applied to my office through my years for jobs. They had good credentials that appeared in college, degrees and everything, and good grades. And yet they came to me in the interview, they failed miserably. They couldn't communicate their thoughts in a, in a coherent, concise way. Uh, they were uncomfortable on their feet speaking. So communication skills, if you want to go in a career in public service, or you want to be a doctor, or a lawyer, or whatever you want to be, that is very, very important. Fine-tune your communication yeah, there, skills. There, and there's one other component to that. When you are talking to someone, and you are interviewing with someone, look them in the eye. I have had more young people come to me that wanted to go to an academy who would stand there and shuffle their feet and stare at the floor. I want somebody that's going to give me a good handshake and eyeball me and say, this is what I really want to do. Another skill that's surprising, learn how to listen. Mm -hmm. That's very important. For our, for our next part of the conversation, we're going to move into building a campaign staff and putting a campaign together. Um, does someone have the first question for that part? Hello, my name is DeAndrea Newsom. I'm from Pine Forest High School in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, my question for you all today is, in your campaign, I'm sure you've had ups and downs. What would you do in the scenario that your members in your campaign are there for the wrong reasons? Wow. <laughs> well, it's always difficult you get rid to tell. Of them. You know, how, do you, how do you determine motivation? That's, that's very difficult. And you, uh, occasionally you read in paper that someone is involved with a campaign for some candidate that does something that is unacceptable to, in normal standards. And the tendency is to quickly blame the candidate. I don't care if the candidate is Republican or Democrat. Uh, the candidate probably isn't at fault. Uh, you don't know the motivation of individuals. You assume that people who volunteer to get involved in your campaign or who make a contribution to your campaign do so because they sort of believe in what you represent and they want to advance the cause, whether it's education or a stronger military, a stronger national, whatever. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to determine motivation, but obviously if someone who is involved with your campaign in a volunteer or even in a paid capacity does something wrong, you have to fess up immediately and uh, remove that, uh, that uh, person from uh, the scenario. You can take that a, se a step farther, and that is in your office. Once you are elected, you have pulled together an office staff. Uh, and, and there has to be some synergy and some interaction between that staff. And if you have that same kind of a person in your office staff, you have to understand quickly they need to go. Let's go to the next question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Nuzzo from Newport Ritchie, Florida. And my question is, was it hard finding people to work on your campaign that had the same political views as you? I didn't have a campaign the first time I ran. The first time I ran for election, it, as, as I said, my husband had died. I was a candidate. He was running against an individual that was an indigent that had, was in jail for beating up a bus driver because he was eating on the bus. So um, I, I didn't have to go through any, I didn't take a campaign contribution. I didn't take a stand on any single issue. Now. Two years later, which comes very, very quickly in the congressional time frame, I am one that believes that two years is, a, is good for, for Congress. Um, I had, I pulled together, by that time I had some understanding, and there were those that were interested in working on my campaign and, and uh, participating. So, but you, you kind of build a, a comfort level with people that you can trust because they go out, as the last question talked about, stand up. And, and represent you and make sure they're ones that represent you well. It, it wasn't e hard for me uh, to find people who uh, were willing to get involved because and most of the people uh, that you were able to track because if you're a candidate, people sort of know what you stand for because you're asked endlessly by the media what's your position on this or what do you believe or why are you running? And so young people particularly 
Well, say, gee, I, I sort of like that. Uh, I want to go work for him if I can. And it's amazing how many young people volunteer. They make a major difference in most campaigns. And I would suggest that the President of the United States right now is in that office in large part because so many young people were excited by what he was saying and the promise he offered. And I'm a Republican. He's a Democrat. And, they, and he got this vast youth movement going. And I thought early in his campaign, gee, he's attractive, he's bright, he's intelligent, he's inspirational. But I didn't think he was ready yet. Uh, well, I was wrong. I mean, because he had so many people that were motivated to get involved in his campaign. So th that's a long way to say, you as a young person, don't just sit in the sidelines and be critical of something or wish something was being accomplished. Jump in, get involved yourself, volunteer. You will be welcomed in most cases with open arms and you get involved and you get a taste of it. Thank you. Thank you. Take the next question. I'm Jack, I'm Jack Wallachy and I am from Malibu, California. My question is, during your different campaigns, what were some issues that you, yourself, and your staff embraced in order to acquire new voters to your voting base? I think you need to look at the uh, individual uh, congressional districts that you represent. Uh, some of them are totally focused on one or two issues, one or two industries or, or areas that, that control those. I mean, you look at a district in New York City, which is probably five high-rise apartments mm -hmm. versus uh, my district was, was very rural. I had agriculture, I had dairy, I had military bases, uh, I had uh, a, a, a cross-section of, of industry and unions. And so you've got to make up your decision on, on representing all the people in your district. It's not one single individual, but it's across the section. Well, I come from a beautiful part of America. I mean, America's beautiful from coast to coast, but from upstate New York, my hometown of Utica is the foothills of the Adirondacks. And as a candidate, I was watching the systematic destruction of those great magnificent lakes, 3,000 of them in the Adirondack Mountains. They were being destroyed by something called acid rain. And a lot of people said, we're going to do something about acid rain. It's killing our lakes. It's robbing us of of a precious resource. And I, that got me very interested. So all through my career in Congress, while I was involved in a lot of different activities as chairman of the Science Committee, uh, but one of the things I continued to focus on was protecting our fragile environment and doing things that I thought were necessary to protect it. And now in retirement, I'm very active in a whole number of worthy causes that are centered on protecting the environment because we're talking about something that we want to leave for you and future generations in better shape than it was when we inherited it. Thank you. Take the next question. Hi, I'm Emily from Jacksonville, North Carolina. And my question is, what is the hardest part of a campaign? Well, the hardest part of the campaign, I think, well, a couple of things. One, uh, the, the necessity for constantly chasing the dollars. Campaigns are very expensive, and you, you virtually become sort of a panhandler. You've got to constantly uh, ask for resources to finance a campaign because they're very expensive. But, but both Bev and I uh, are typical of members of Congress. You believe in what you're doing, so you're not reluctant to ask people. You know, And, and so if a lot of people give, uh, that makes the burden a little bit less for those who are dependent on just a few sources of that. But the other thing is, it is, is uh, you're not in control of your own schedule because there's so many events in there occur just like that. You know the instant age we're in. There's a new story every nanosecond. And so you've got to be able to respond to that. So uh, you're very busy, but you're actively engaged in the issues that people are reading about every day, uh, uh, hearing about in the radio or TV, and uh, Hopefully, you're going to do things. I tell people I had the best job ever. I'm involved every day in, in activities that hopefully will make life better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. The interesting thing on that, on that point is that there's no day 
that's the same. Mm -hmm. And if anybody is interested in a structured day, forget looking at government service because mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way. One of the things that, that is, is so much of a challenge and a positive in my estimation, and that is the variety of things that you can do. I am much happier worrying about someone's social security uh, and being able to cut through the red tape to help individuals. And, and that's a component that I think is very much uh, a part of, of, uh, of a member of Congress. You've got uh, the bigger picture, and everybody loves to think I've got some major impact. Uh, I put together uh, the American Discovery Trail, which goes from one coast to the other. Uh, rails to trails legislation. It's things that I care about. Uh, and I, can, I look back now and I think, you know, we've got those in place. Uh, the the dollar-driven thing to, the, today is just absolutely something that I'm not sure I could, I could function under. I, it's very hard for me to ask people for funds. Speaking of fundraising, we're going to turn to the next part of the conversation, focusing on fundraising. <laughs> so we'll take our, our first question about that. Segway. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Raymond Kenworthy from Washington State. My question is, does how much you fundraise depend, predict how, who will win the election? Well, it's not always ac an accurate barometer. In other words, the theory of that question is that he who has the most wins and he who has the least loses. But that's not always the case. I think the best ideas determine the outcome of a campaign. But if you've got the best ideas in the world and you don't have any financial support in order to convey your message on radio, TV, and in mailings, well, no one's going to know about those ideas. So it takes the best ideas to win, but the best ideas supported by the resources to make sure those ideas are conveyed to the widest possible audience and your prospective constituency. You know, one of the things that you need to look at, and, and, and I cited an inner city New York district that is totally high rises. You have to be able to be competitive in the, uh, in the TV and the radio market there. A lot of districts, uh, my district, I would have had to buy Washington, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia TV time, which was ludicrous because you just get small little segments. And so consequently, uh, we used a lot of uh, shoe leather, leather. We used a lot of young people that would go out every Friday night and go door to door. Uh, we used a lot of uh, local radio stations. So each of the districts are a little bit different, and the member has to understand what works in their district versus uh, works, in the, and that is controlling of, of your finances. Thank you. Hi, I'm Connor. I'm from Connecticut. And uh, as I understand, the spending of an average winning congressional campaign is somewhere around the range of $1.2 million. What I'd just like to know is where exactly that money comes from, and more importantly, where does it go? Does it go to funding of staff, or does it go to fundraising, or somewhere else? All of the above. Uh, first of all, I think your figures are a little bit low. Uh, 1.2 <laughs> years ago, that, that would be a relatively inexpensive campaign today. A winning campaign, uh, more often than not, is in excess of two million dollars, and that's for a House seat. And when you're talking about the Senate. Katie bar the door. I mean, the ceiling is very high. But you get that money from people, people who you convince uh, that your message is something that, that resonates with them, that is meaningful to them. And so you, you have direct mail solicitations, and you'd be surprised how many dollars come in through people sending in a buck or five or ten dollars. Uh, you have fundraisers, and you, you charge a higher price for the ticket to the fundraisers, and you try to convince people that an investment to buy a ticket to the fundraiser is a wise investment because you're a good candidate. Uh, you have a, a whole wide range of interest. I mean, for example, you look to your profession. Supposing you're an insurance agent. Well, people are interested in your your profession so you might have a, a fundraiser with all insurance agents or all doctors or all lawyers there are a whole wide range of avenues to explore to get the funding for the campaign and, and I'll tell you where it goes the most expensive part of the campaign is television advertising 
and, and that is prohibitively expensive for some. If you live in New York City, you just can't, I mean, you've got to raise just a million dollars to pay for television alone. But uh, mailings, direct mailings, brochures to pass out at rallies, buttons, these things all add up. And then when you finally get the bills, you say, where am I going to get the money to pay for this? Then you have to go out and ask for more. There's a new group that is controlling a lot of political arenas today, and that is the consultants, the political consultants. Some of them are nice, and some of them are not so nice. And we hear on a regular basis about the smutty campaigns, the dirty campaigns, etc. I am one that believes so strongly that you need to put your best foot forward in a positive manner. And yet we've seen in the political arena in this day and age an awful lot of negative ads. And they're, all, they're created by a whole coterie of people uh, that are making an awful lot of money off of a political campaign uh, doing negative ads. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that very sad. I, re I really do. Uh, I would just as soon get $20 or $10 from a young person who worked hard to get it than a $500 contribution from somebody that can write out a check and not pay any attention to it. Because that young person is going to be there and going to be working for you. And I think we both share the view that yeah. people want to know what you're for. They don't want to know what you're against. They want to know what you're for. Yeah. What do you represent? Why don't we take two more Thank quick you. questions on this topic. <coughs> Hi, my name is Avery. I'm from California. I was wondering if you thought that the price of campaigning has been affected by the recent recession. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear the question. If I thought the price of campaigns... Has been affected by the recent recession. So is it harder to no. raise money now? Yes. No. There are more fundraisers going on in this town today at a higher price than we've ever seen before. And part of the reason for that, I think, is the shrill voices you're hearing out there, I don't think represent the vast majority of the American people. If you've been watching TV lately, you see how town uh, meetings, town hall meetings that representatives have across the country are being interrupted by people who shout and everything. And you see some narrow special interests trying to dominate everything. And you see with climate change or health care a lot of misinformation uh, out in the public arena. And so it's important uh, to, to raise the, the, the money to be able to tell a more actual, real-life story of what is happening in these arenas rather than have people believe so much misinformation that's out there. Sherry, there's a, there's, a new, there's a new phenomenon that I think is extremely dangerous, and we're, we're hearing about it on a regular basis now, and that is YouTube, where there is no uh, recourse for misinformation. There is no one that is going to be able to say, that's absolutely ludicrous, it's absolutely wrong. And there are a large number of segment of the population that will be, believe whatever they hear is gospel uh, on, on their... Uh, Computer. We have about a minute left, so let's take one last quick question. Um, hello, my name is Chris O'Keefe. I'm from Perth Amboy, New Jersey. My question is, behind every campaign, of course you need money in fundraising. What builds a successful fundraising campaign? A database. Yep, database. You've got to, you've got to know who the people are that you want to uh, influence favorably. And uh, so names, addresses, telephone numbers, because you get on the phone, you call them, you write them a letter. But that's very important. So the, the, the initial stage of a campaign, you've got to have the input of all this data, and you've got to have people assembling it. I mean, that, that's time uh, and uh, time intensive, but it's so very important. We used to have everything on a three-by-five card. Well, that's uh, back in the dark ages, and it wasn't that long ago. So today you just push a button and you can, you can program to, to whatever direction you want a mailing to go. And, and so your, your database is critical. All right. Unfortunately, Good question. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. This was a wonderful discussion, and I thank the students of the Congressional Youth Leadership Council for their excellent questions. And thank you also, of course, to Congresswoman Byron oh, and Congressman Bullard. We really appreciate it. 
This webcast will be archived on the website's uh, Lou Fry Institute, that's loufry.org, and the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress at usafmc.org. Our next webcast is in two weeks, and we will focus on the work of a newly elected legislator when he or she first arrives on Capitol Hill. We hope you will join us for what will certainly be another very interesting program. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.